Hello, my name is Jason Leosatis, um, Global Peace Radio. I've got the great pleasure today of um, very lucky to have a fantastic guest uh, who I'm sure you all know. His name is uh, Mr. Nom Chomsky. Um, thank you very much for coming on the, on the Global Peace Program, Nom. I very much appreciate it. Glad to be with you. It's great. You're a, you're a fantastic inspiration um, to, to many, many, many people. Um, you're one of the very few people, in my opinion, um, to, to, to have the great courage to actually talk about the real dilemma, if you like, that um, humanity is currently in. And I suppose we could say has been in for quite some time, really, but um, it's a big subject, I know, and we haven't got a tremendous amount of time, obviously. Um, um, I'm all about, as you probably know, I'm all about finding peace. I talk about, I talk about ethics, morals, empathy, all the things that, as humanity, we seem to be compromising with. And ethical compromises, for me, is one of the greatest dangers we face, um, which is spearheaded, obviously, by governments generally, with, you know, operating without vision and wisdom to a great degree, and not looking down the timeline to see those feedback loops which are coming back to, to hit us, even though we can't see them reaching fruition uh, quite yet. Uh, what do you feel about that, uh, Noam? Could you say a few words about that, that subject? It's a very alive subject, and uh, it has uh, dramatic implications. So instead of talking about it abstractly, let's talk about a specific case. Yep. Uh, a while back, uh, the United States uh, sent highly trained uh, uh, special forces, uh, Navy SEALs, uh, to invade Pakistan uh, to uh, break into the compound where uh, one of their enemies, Osama bin Laden, was uh, uh, holed up. Uh, they killed a couple people, uh, broke into his apartment, uh, he was unarmed, uh, defenseless, his wife was with him, uh, uh, on instructions from the White House, they murdered him, uh, threw his body into the ocean without autopsy. Uh, that has obvious consequences throughout the Muslim world, in fact it should everywhere, but it's much more than that. Uh, the Navy SEALs who were sent in there were under orders to fight their way out if they were trapped, and they could have been. Pakistan has an advanced army, a dedicated, loyal army committed to the defending the sovereignty of the country, uh, very well armed, they have lots of nuclear weapons, uh, and if they found them in time, they wouldn't have just let them walk out. Well, the U.S. forces would never have allowed them to be trapped, the whole force of the U.S. Uh, armaments would have been used to extricate them, and it almost happened, very close to happening. The uh, chief of staff of the Pakistani army, General Kayani, was informed that there had been an intrusion into uh, uh, Pakistani uh, airspace. Uh, his first assumption was it was from India, Pakistan and India, a tense relationship, ordered the, the uh, Air Forces, other forces to mobilize uh, to uh, prevent, to respond to this intrusion. Uh, meanwhile, at the same time, General David Petraeus, commander, U.S. regional commander in Kabul, Afghanistan, ordered the U.S. Air Force to start scrambling jets, get ready for an action. Uh, this means we were very close to war with Pakistan which could have easily turned into a nuclear war, which could have destroyed all of us. Uh, by now it's well understood, has been for a long time, that a, a major nuclear war uh, would destroy the attacker, even if there was no response. Even if a first strike, uh, the effects of it would be so enormous, leading to kind of what's called global winter, that probably destroy the attacker as well. Well, we were close to that. Uh, the Obama administration was willing to take that chance, uh, though there were other ways of, uh, uh, of finding and uh, apprehending bin Laden, who, remember, was a suspect, not proven guilty of anything, but he probably, presumably was 
responsible for 9-11, but that's a little different than demonstrating it in a court. A court of law has, has been required by Anglo-American law for 800 years since Magna Carta, uh, but they were willing to risk a nuclear war, and it gets worse. The uh, technique by which bin Laden was uh, identified and his location was identified was a CIA operation which carried out a fake vaccination campaign in Abbottabad, the poorest areas of it, the town where they thought he was. That's a very serious violation of principles that go back as far as the Hippocratic Oath, you know, thousands of years. And they cut off the vaccination campaign in the middle because they found he was somewhere else, which is a further crime. But it goes on. Uh, in much of the world, the third world, uh, people are pretty skeptical about uh, the white men come in and start uh, sticking things in their arms. And what are they up to? I mean, I've seen it myself in many, many parts of the world. And you can understand it. After all, they have some experience with uh, white invaders who come and do things that are very pretty. So what are these guys doing coming in here and you know, sticking needles in their arms? It takes a lot of work to convince people that they should undergo vaccination campaigns. Well, this, there happens to be a major, there was, it's now ended, a major vaccination campaign in Pakistan. Uh, polio has been almost eradicated in the world. It could go the way of smallpox, totally eliminated. And it's a dread disease. Uh, Pakistan is one of the few places where uh, uh, polio is still uh, endemic, very alive. And there were uh, there were uh, UN vaccination teams working in uh, in uh, Pakistan to try to uh, overcome and eliminate this dread disease. Well, as soon as the fake vaccination campaign was exposed, the fears that people already have were given a solid basis. And pretty soon, uh, the UN health workers were being abducted. Some of them killed. The UN had to pull out the whole vaccination team. Uh, one and the effects were felt, in fact, as far as Nigeria, uh, also with this polio. Uh, well, the uh, uh, estimates are, by US medical specialists, that uh, maybe 100,000 people in Pakistan will contract polio as a result of this operation. And one specialist, called the university professor, added some pointing to this uh, child uh, uh, sitting in a wheelchair, crippled, and say, you did it, you Americans did it. And that has consequences. And in fact, quite generally, the US is engaged in a terrorist manufacturing campaign, campaign to create terrorists. This is one example. People will call terrorists if there's revenge. Uh, another example, striking example, is right at the time of the Boston Marathon bombings, pretty close to a young police officer who was murdered, was killed right outside my office. Uh, and everyone here, a lot of people here felt it personally. It was a real tragedy. At the same time, about two days later, uh, there was a drone attack in southern Yemen. Uh, the, uh, and it should be recognized that drones, they're presented to us as uh, devices that surgically eliminate a particular person. It's not true. They are terror weapons. They terrorize towns, villages, whole regions. And you can see why. I mean, suppose you're walking down the street in your neighborhood and you don't know if uh, five minutes from now there's going to be a sudden explosion from some unknown source that'll kill the guy standing across the street and uh, everyone who happens to be near him. Uh, well, that's you're terrorized. You have to live like that. It's a major terror weapon, and the drone campaigns are a huge terror campaign. And have effects. So what happened 
after the right the time of the Boston Marathon bombing. Well, there was a drone attack in a village, an isolated village in Yemen. Uh, most of these we don't know about, but this one we happen to know about because a young man from the village was studying here and he testified to the Senate about it. And he pointed out that uh, there had been uh, the jihadis, you know, the Islamic radical elements in Yemen had been trying for years to turn the villagers against the United States. And they'd failed because all these people knew about the United States was uh, what he wrote to them. And he liked being in the United States and wrote favorable things. But he added that this one drone attack achieved what the jihadis had failed to do in several years. Now the people hate America. It just was he was in this task. Uh, well, this goes on all the time. Yeah. It's a terrorist generating system, and it carries with it threats as far as the threat of nuclear war, I just gave an example, as well as all kinds of side effects, like uh, maybe 100,000 polio victims in uh, Pakistan. Thank, thank you, Noam. It's, it's a very good example, and thank you very much for that. I, I feel always feel very emotional when, when people talk about these things, because I talk like yourself about these things a lot, and I'm talking a lot at the moment about, um, I wrote a piece yesterday, the other day called, I called it Kill Them Just In Case. So what we're seeing now is ethical compromises to such a degree that it's it's murder without trial, as you said, like with someone like Bin Laden, he was only a suspect. Murder without trial for the victim and the perpetrators. And it's the same with the drones. It's all, I, I see it, it's almost like um, it, you see someone who think you might, who might get a gun, so you kill them just in case. Or someone who might be a, a terrorist and you kill them just in case. And, and this is terrorists accusing other people of being terrorists. There's no doubt the greatest terror threat in the, in the, in the whole world now is Israel and the U.S. There's no doubt. I mean, they talk about, um, you know, um, uh, a nuclear threat from Iran. And meanwhile, they, they've used depleted uranium, uh, as you know, um, and themselves with, with, with a, almost a genocide, genocidal effects in Iraq. Um, it's in the lawmakers are the lawbreakers. And they're almost like magicians with amnesia. I think, Norm, they, they, they sort of, they're like children in a nuclear reactor. They can't seem to help but to fight and kill people. Um, and, and we're getting used to it. Um, we're getting used to used to it. That's the problem, isn't it? I don't know, getting used to it, but accepting it in the most astonishing ways. So it's kind of interesting. It's, I mean, it's shocking to see how yeah. uh, educated uh, liberal, progressive uh, intellectuals are reacting to these things. Yeah. So um, along the, towards the more jingoist, chauvinist end. Yeah. So for example, a little while ago there was a drone attack in Yemen, uh, which happened to kill uh, several little girls. And uh, a well-known American commentator, liberal commentator, Joe Klein, was asked whether he didn't think there was something wrong with this. And what he said is, uh, it's better that their little girls should be killed than ours. In other words, it's fine for us to kill someone who we suspect may ultimately want to harm us. Uh, and to kill a couple of girls. But yeah. uh, otherwise, who knows? Maybe we'd be harmed someday. Can't find words to no. it, it, the it, nature of this. It, it, it is incredible, and, and I think that's the greatest danger at the moment. Well, as you well know, be, being a gentleman who talks about what you talk about, um, the greatest threat to humanity at the moment is our own minds. I mean, that's a pretty sweeping statement, but I think that's pretty much true because our minds create and manifest, our thoughts create and manifest most of the things we see around us, be it a tin of beans, a, a, you know, a block of flats or war or peace. And this is what we've forgotten, I think, as human beings, is that the people who are running this world and actually those feedback loops and those consequences without wisdom and vision are already like a tsunami. It's like kicking a bucket of water. It's going to come back and get us. And we only got to look at what's going on in um, 
in, in Guantanamo, Guantanamo now that they are so possessed with controlling people and being the top dog is they won't even allow someone to kill themselves. I'd like to hear your uh, comments on that in a minute. They won't allow anyone in, uh, in, in Guantanamo to kill themselves. That's how, that's how um, sort of controlling they are. And like you said about people, uh, Nom, I think there's an intrinsic fear of punishment within most people. And that's why I respect you so much, because in your position, you could quite easily not talk about this, you know. And I really respect you for that, to actually say it as it is. And most pe people fear punishment, an intrinsic fear of government punishment. If they speak out, they'll be punished. And, and actually, they will. That's another thing I'd like to ask you about. Is like, you know, they talk about oh, Assad being brutal to his, his people and Mladic and this kind of thing. And they were, had war crimes against humanity, uh, Mladic. But I mean, Tony Blair Bush and, 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 and Obama and these people, Sarkozy, they've killed by far more people than Mla a, 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 a Ratclaw Mladic. And, and they're not being tried for, for war crimes against humanity. So I, I'd like to ask you about uh, Guantanamo, what you think about the white man, like you said earlier on, he certainly speaks with fork tongue. <laughs> and he thinks he's the top dog. It's, 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 um, it's definitely uh, apartheid. It's, I've been in South Africa, I got shot at, so I know what apartheid's all about in the 80s. So it's that thing that they just can't help but to keep punishing people. It's almost like they're almost sadists, you know, when they're shoving those pipes down people's nose. It's almost a sadistic, masochistic symbiosis. People are let in, letting them do these things. And I think people feel helpless. How, how can people change? Can you speak about that a bit, Nom, please? Well, we have to. Actually, sadistic is the right word when you read the yeah. testimony people who've been through these experiences, it is, you know, it's just utterly devastating. The one book that I really urge that people read, I think it's very persuasive, is by an Australian. Uh, his name is David Hicks. Uh, he was picked up in Afghanistan by the uh, Northern Alliance, the forces on the ground that were cooperating with the United States. Uh, he, he probably wasn't doing anything as an Australian hitchhiker up there. So he was picked up. He was sold to the Americans for bounty. They do that. And, uh, and then he was in the hands of the American army for, I think, about six years. At first at the Bagram base in uh, Afghanistan, which is a huge torture chamber then several years in Guantanamo. And he describes in chilling detail the ways he was treated. Uh, and it's just, you just can't believe that human beings can do this. And uh, I think if anyone reads it, will realize it's a very credible account and reinforced by many others. You know, have plenty of evidence of that kind. Uh, he also points out something which I found rather striking. He says that the American soldiers who were carrying out these sadistic and brutal acts were terrified of, the, uh, of their captives. They had been so indoctrinated that they regarded the people they were imprisoned as superhuman. Uh, he said soldiers would come to his cage, you know, he can't move shackled and ask him to perform some of his amazing tricks for them, you know, like climb on the ceiling or whatever. And if they ever took a prisoner out, shackled, you know, uh, handcuffed, barely moved, you know, practically destroyed by sadistic torture, they'd have to have a whole, you know, a whole array of uh, heavily armed uh, soldiers and police just to make sure that he didn't, that the captive didn't turn on him and kill him all. You know, he said they really were frightened. Gee. And I uh, was probably correctly that that's the result of intensive indoctrination. And it extends over the whole society. It's a very frightened society. Yeah. I mean, take the gun culture in the United States, it's pretty interesting. Why do people feel they have to have guns? Well, for a lot of people, it's, uh, it's because they are genuinely frightened of uh, 
things like uh, of possibilities like say that the UN will come uh, and uh, take over the country and uh, commit genocide or eliminate our sovereignty or that the federal government is suddenly going to break in and you know and uh, murder and uh, control them uh, these things are beyond paranoia you know uh, but it's it's not uncommon in the country it's actually been a frightened country since its origin good study of this but now it's taking on a, a really almost a psychotic form and a lot of it is driven by and the, the developed hysteria. Recall, for example, that right before the Iraq invasion, when the Bush administration was trying to uh, uh, organize, mobilize popular support for the planned invasion, uh, there, uh, there were all kinds of hysterical uh, pronouncements of Condoleezza Rice and others about uh, how the next thing we're going to see is um, a mushroom cloud over New York. We got to defend ourselves from these crazed uh, uh, Arabs who are trying to, uh, all of them want to kill us, murder us. Uh, what can we do? Go over there and invade them and uh, uh, terrorize them. Well, you know, that's uh, when a mood like that spreads in a, a country that has extraordinary power, means of violence, uh, that vastly exceed anyone else in the world. Then you're in a then you're in a very dangerous situation. You're right. Uh, you're right. Mark. Dangerous for you right. the world. I think we are run by so we're running out of time, unfortunately. Don't I? I think, but we are definitely our condition is our conditioning is one of our dangers, and we're, we're, we're run by psychotic people. They've gone insane. There's no doubt about it, and it's infectious to the population. And you know, I think we've got to try and. Um, operate somehow without government control or, or start our own systems or we're in big big trouble we can't rely on them anymore to, 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 for the future can we really you know yeah. Yeah. think through things for ourselves and fight our way out of these indoctrination systems yep exactly Norm exactly Norm I'd like to speak to you for another two hours I'm unfortunately we're out of time and I know you're a very busy man and I'd love to speak to you again sometime if we could and um I really appreciate you coming on Global Peace uh, Radio and thank you for all your fantastic commitment to sanity and peace and, and stability in the world and we need more people like you. Thank you very, very much. Yes, and I'm very glad about what you're doing. It's extremely important. Thank, thank you, Nom. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. Bye, Nom. Thank you very much. Uh, can you...